Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to begin discussing unemployment. So I will create a playlist with a series of videos highlighting unemployment. Unemployment in the United States, which will be our applied example, over decades, we can see cycles upwards and downwards. So we're going back to 1955, and we can see that in 1955, the United States unemployment rate was 4.4%, and then over time it rises to 6.8%, and then falls back down to 3.5%. So this is helpful data, or these are useful data points for macroeconomists, because since the unemployment rate cycles upwards and downwards, it falls in alignment with the business cycle. So when we see unemployment low at 3.5%, that could signal that we are entering or in an inflationary gap. And when we see unemployment rising to 9.7%, that could signal that we are entered a recessionary gap. But this is relative to some type of baseline. So as we collect data over years and decades, we can determine the long run average level of unemployment in a particular economy, which will establish our natural rate of unemployment. So we can see that for the most part, the US economy's, uh, economy kind of hovers between five and 6%. There's periods where it goes above 6%, which could signal a recessionary gap. And there's periods where it falls below 5%, which signals that we're entering an inflationary gap. So if we're determining that between 5 and 6%, let's say 5.5% is the natural rate or the long run average level of unemployment in the economy, if we see unemployment exceeding 5.5% or falling below 5.5%, that will help us determine whether or not we're entering a recessionary or inflationary gap. Okay. So again, this goes back to the idea of the business cycle that we see here in graph B. We're measuring real GDP on the y-axis and time in years or decades on the x-axis. And we know that economies expand, achieve economic growth, and they also contract. So we're at point A, we're achieving an expansion in the economy. So point B would be the peak of that business cycle. And this would be the inflationary gap portion of the business cycle. And then as the economy contracts into a recessionary gap, going from point C to point D, the trough of this cycle, then we know that the economy is entering a recessionary gap. And so we can use that data to build a trend line, which is this blue line right here, which we call the long-term growth trend. And it's important to note that that blue line being the long-term growth trend is equal to the potential GDP of the economy. This signals when we are employing the number of uh, resources that we should be employing to produce the outputs that we should be producing at point A, at point C, at point E. That is our potential GDP, which is the same as or equal to our full potential GDP, which is equal to our full employment. We're fully employing the resources, the land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship that we should be employing in our economy to generate outputs, which is equal to the natural rate. So these are all the same thing. The long-term growth trend, that blue line on the business cycle is equal to potential GDP, equal to full potential GDP, equal to full employment, equal to that natural rate of unemployment, which is reflected here at YP or potential income or potential GDP. So essentially what we see here is that this blue trend line is our LRAS curve, right? This blue long run tr uh, growth trend is our long run average, uh, long run average supply curve, average supply of outputs in our economy when we are employing the resources that we should be employing at points A, C, and E. So hopefully you can see that connection between the long term growth trend and the LRAS curve and the concept of potential income or potential GDP, okay? Again, just to uh, reiterate how the ADAS model relates to the business cycle, we have graphed how if 81 shifts out, let's say to, oops, 
82. All right, perhaps consumer confidence is high, interest rates are low. We're going to 82. We're going from point A to point B, which is here. We see that the economy is entering an inflationary gap. Why inflation? Okay. Going from point A to point B is similar to the business cycle here. We are entering the inflationary gap. The economy is overheating. It is expanding. Okay. And we can also illustrate that recessionary gap. So if AD1 contracted into, let's say, 83, we're going to change the labeling here. We'll start at point C. We're at point C where 81 intersects SRS1 equals LRES. And uh, perhaps consumer and business confidence has fallen. Maybe interest rates are quite high. There's decreased consumption and investment spending. Then we fall into, let me use, let me be uh, consistent here. Then we fall into that recessionary gap, which I'll label Y recession, which is going from point C to point D. Okay. So the ADAS model really is reflecting the business cycle. We're measuring real GDP on the x-axis x-axis, and the prices of goods and services on average on the y-axis. Okay. So now that we have an understanding of that, let's go over the four types of unemployment. All right. So let's just get rid of a few things. And begin discussing the four types of unemployment. Okay, let me uh, just, perhaps it's better if I just quickly recreate this graph, and then we can discuss how we can use this model to illustrate that, okay? There we go. Perfect. All right. So LRES, right? Reflective of full employment. We're fully employing our resources to generate the amount of outputs that our economy should be producing. Then we'll have our aggregate demand curve, 81, and our short run aggregate supply curve, upward sloping, SRES1. Okay. Right. So here we are at this intersection, point A, potentially. And we'll see that at YP, we are at potential GDP. So YP is reflective of potential GDP. Or full employment. And since it is equal to full employment, it is thus equal to the natural rate. The natural rate of unemployment, which is equal to, there's three types of unemployment at that point. So one of them is structural unemployment. And that includes individuals who have lost their jobs because their skills have become obsolete. Um, for example, let's say, um, you know, uh, bank tellers at one point, uh, when you used to, you know, back in the day, you used to go into a bank to deposit your cash and someone would count that cash and deposit for you. But now we have automated teller machines, ATMs. So those have replaced those jobs. Uh, perhaps you've gone to McDonald's and instead of someone taking your order, you can just punch in your order into one of those giant iPads as you walk in. So that technology has replaced those jobs. Most people have become structurally unemployed. Um, other people may have lost their jobs because 
uh, a business has left uh, the area or a factory has left the city that they work in. And so they stay in that city and they become structured unemployed. So that's structural unemployment. Structural unemployment plus another type of unemployment, which is frictional unemployment. People who are between jobs, people who are fired or quit or in the process of finding their next job after leaving their job, they are frictionally unemployed. And we also have, um, let's see here, I'll use this one. Those that are seasonally un unemployed, people who have seasonal jobs. So if you're a lifeguard um, or if you uh, are hired to harvest uh, crops from a farm at a particular time of the year, then you are seasonally unemployed in the period of time that you're not working. So seasonal unemployment. So we saw in the United States that their long run average level of unemployment would be something like 5.5%, right? It's almost impossible to get unemployment down to zero because you're always going to have people that are going to lose, be losing their jobs because their skills have become obsolete, perhaps because of te new technology. People who quit their jobs today and are in the process of looking for their next job or have been fired, that is unav unavoidable. So there's always going to be some level of friction unemployment. And then we're also going to have some seasonal unemployment. And so macroeconomists and governments are seeking to reduce the amount of structural, frictional, and seasonal unemployment to lower their long-run long run average level of unemployment. Okay? So these are three of the four types of unemployment, structural, frictional, seasonal. What is the other type? The other type is what we call um, cyclical unemployment. Okay? So cyclical unemployment occurs when we go into a recessionary gap. So that would cover this area here, all right? This area here covers a recessionary gap. And here we have unemployment, and I'll make a note over here. Here we see that unemployment is greater than the natural rate of unemployment. And why is that? Well, we notice that here, unemployment includes the following. So we have unemployment at this stage between zero and YP, unemployment being greater. And unemployment here is including, we have the structural unemployment. As always, we have the frictional unemployment. We have the seasonal but also we have an additional one called cyclical. Cyclical unemployment. Unemployment created within the business cycle, which is occurring within the downturn of the business cycle. So when we go from point C to point D to point E, in that recessionary gap, we have structural, frictional, seasonal, and also business cycle cyclical unemployment. Unemployment that has been created due to the fall in aggregate demand. Aggregate demand has potentially fallen into a recessionary gap and uh, we have a lack of aggregate demand. And so if AD shifts in from 81 to 82, firms will begin to reduce the quantity of their aggregate supply and begin to fire resources and thus we're entering that recessionary gap, okay? The Last type of uh, cycle or gap that we need to talk about is the inflationary gap. And that occurs here. So we're gonna go from YP, I'm gonna make a note here, YP onwards. And the type of unemployment that occurs here is unemployment being less than the natural rate. So unemployment in the inflationary gap is less than the natural rate of unemployment. And that means that there is zero cyclical unemployment. So cyclical unemployment equals zero.
and we have reduced structural, frictional, and seasonal unemployment. People who should be structurally or frictionally or seasonally unemployed are now finding work because firms are competing for increasingly scarce resources like labor, they are now beginning to employ those who used to be structurally, frictionally, and seasonally unemployed within that inflationary gap. And why is that? Again, in other videos we've looked at, that as 80 shifts out from 81 to 82, and we're going from point A to point B, firms begin to increase the quantity of their aggregate supply, and thus they need to employ more resources like labor. And all that is left because cyclical unemployment is at zero is those who are structurally friction unemployed. So firms begin to hire them. Okay. So this is how we can illustrate using the ADAS model, the four types of unemployment, just simply LRAS 81, SRAS 1 at point A and highlight from zero to YP recessionary gap. We have unemployment greater than the natural rate of unemployment meaning that we have structural, frictional, seasonal unemployment, and in addition, cyclical unemployment. At YP, we are at full potential GDP or full employment, which is the natural rate of employment, which is equal to structural, frictional, and seasonal unemployment. And from YP onto perhaps infinity, the inflationary gap, here we have unemployment less than the natural rate of unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is at zero, and we have uh, reduced structural, frictional, and seasonal unemployment. Okay, and that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Take care and see you next time.